Thank you.
Welcome to episode one of TMCI TV, brought to you by the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. I'm your host, Keisha Dionko Lennon. Today, we will be talking about an exciting topic from the Santan Dry Eye Science series. We'd like to encourage everyone to fill out the attendance and evaluation form that will be posted later in the comments section below. Now, to formally begin, we have our EVI director, Dr. Victor Caparas to provide us with an overview of TMCI TV and the Santan Head of Asia, Mr. Isao Takahashi, to give us a short message. Good afternoon. The coronavirus pandemic has disrupted human life in too many ways to mention. 
Our fabric of life has unraveled, leaving us wondering if we can pick up the threads and weave them back together again. While we hope that somehow things will return to what they were, we already suspect that they will not, and that we are in the new normal. Consider these words of the poet Matsuo Basho. Every day is a journey, and the journey itself is home. These words get the measure of our current state of rapid social change but they also exactly characterize our work as doctors and scientists. In medicine and science, there is no fixed normal, only continuous learning and change. This theme of adapting to change is the spirit in which we launch ITV, this new medium of the Eye and Vision Institute of the Medical City. We intend ITV to be a dynamic and versatile facilitator of ophthalmic education to everyone who's interested in the Philippines and beyond, made possible by this new tool of online meetings. Not least of all, our theme of continuous learning and change is exemplified by our guest speaker, who has been instrumental in pioneering a novel way of thinking about dry eye disease and who has turned it into a practical yet elegant and effective clinical tool. You will see in a while how well adapted peer film oriented diagnosis is to this new direction towards telemedicine and remote diagnosis. True to our theme of change, our guest speaker speaks to us this afternoon about the latest evolution of the TFOD TFOD concept. Professor Norihiko Yokoi is well known to us and a frequent visitor to the Philippines. He honors yet again with his unstinting willingness to share his expertise, and we are again very grateful. Likewise, we are grateful to Santen for their resolute commitment to medical education and for their continuing support for our projects and for helping make ITV possible. I wish everyone a pleasant and educational afternoon. My name is Isao Takahashi, and I am the head of Asia Business of Santen. Sending this greeting from Tokyo, Japan. Good evening to all the Philippine ophthalmologists and all the rest of the ophthalmologists and the Santen staff in the Southeast Asian region who have joined this significant webinar. Special greetings to the organizers headed by the director of the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute, Dr. Victor Caparas. We humbly acknowledge and thank you for this opportunity to partner with your institution through this digital medical vehicle, TMC-ITB, on its inaugural episode entitled Decreased Wettability Type of Dry Eye, the new important concept in tear film oriented diagnosis. It is with great pride that I also want to recognize and honor Professor Norihiko Yokoi for his stimulating lecture and insights on the TFOT and the TFOT concept. At this moment, we are unsure when the COVID-19 will be overthrow of the world. Nevertheless, under this new normal, something will continue to focus on patient centricity by exploring new opportunities in providing support to eye education and patient eye care. Something will remain to support your continuing medical development by ensuring variable partnership for webinars such as this event we have tonight. <coughs> Again, thank you for having something as your partner and congratulations for your inaugural episode of TMC ITB. Mabuhai, thank you.
Again, we welcome all of you to the Sun and Dry Eye Science Series. Today, we have four speakers. Our first lecturer is Professor Norihiko Yokoi. He is a professor, a hospital professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at Kyoto Prefectural University of Medicine, where he also obtained his MD and PhD. He did his fellowship in Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology at the University of Oxford. Currently, he specializes in external eye disease, ocular surface disease, dry eye, and tear film physiology. We are very pleased to have with us today Professor Norihiko Yokoi for the first lecture. Professor Yokoi? Thank you, Kesia, a moderator, for your kind introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. It is my great pleasure to have opportunity to, to talk here at the ITB web conference. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kapalas and Santen for their kind invitation. Today, I would like to talk about decreased wettability dry eye, the new in, important concept in tear film oriented diagnosis and therapy for dry eye. I will give an introduction on how to diagnose and treat cases of decreased wettability dry eye based on t and the t concept. This slide shows my disclosure of COI. This slide illustrates the difference of corneal surface between normal eyes and cases of dry eye. As seen in those movies, in normal eyes, the tear film is stable and it's not easily broken up even when the eye is kept open. In contrast, in cases of dry eye, the tear film is unstable and easily breaks up with resultant epithelial damage. The visible abnormality of unstable tear film reflecting in the fluorescent breakup and epithelial damage is helpful and essential to diagnose dry eye. In 2040, the Asia Dry Eye Society held a diagnostic definition and the dry eye collaborative investigation meeting and we propose to hear our definition of dry eye from the Asia Dry Eye Society to define more precisely the dry eye cases that we encounter clinically. In this definition, dry eye is defined as a multifactorial disease characterized by unstable tear film, causing a variety of symptoms, potentially accompanied by tear surface damage. We emphasized here the importance of unstable tear film as a visible core manifestation of dry eye. One of the most important property of tear film is the stability. The four components that support tear film stability are the tear film lipid layer, that is thought to suppress evaporation of acus tears from the acus layer. Acus tears, uh, of tear film in which sufficient acus tear volume is important for supporting tear film stability. Secretory mucin, MAC5AC of tear film, which gives a gel character to the acus layer, and the membrane associated mucins of the ocular surface epithelium, especially the longest MAC16, which retain wettability of the corneal surface epithelium. With abnormalities one, two, three, and or four, the tear film becomes unstable, thus resulting in tear film breakup that leads to epithelial damage. t and t tear film oriented diagnosis and therapy, respectively are used to find the components responsible for tear film breakup from four, one to four and supplement insufficient components to treat dry eye via the stabilization of tear film have advanced in Japan. The t and the t -Fort concept in Japan has advanced after dicohoso sodium eye drops became available. In December 2010, 3% dicohoso sodium eye drop became commercially available in Japan. This molecule is P2 white receptor agonist. Many studies have indicated that when dicohosol sodium eye drops are instilled, dicohosol connects with the P2 white receptor. 
that is stimulating the production of ACAS tears from the conjunctival epithelium via the activation of the chloride channel and stimulating the release of MAC5AC from the conjunctival goblet cells and increase the expression of MAC membrane associated mucins, include, including MAC16. That increase of three components leads to the stabilization of the tear film. Accordingly, Ticohosal sodium eye drops are expected to become a promising treatment for dry eye via the supplementation of the components to stabilize the tear film. This scheme produced by the Dry Eye Society of Japan shows the detailed concept of tear film oriented therapy or teapot, illustrating the target for therapy and the possible candidate for topical eye therapy currently available in Japan and elsewhere to improve tear film stability. In this concept, the detection of the insufficient components of the ocular surface responsible for tear film breakout is the first step, which is followed by the supplementation of insufficient components to attenuate dry eye symptoms via the prevention of tear film breakout. However, for the detection of the insufficient components of the ocular surface responsible for, for tear film breakup, T-POT, tear film oriented diagnosis is essential. And for T-POT, classification of breakup pattern is the most effective and useful. Please watch this movie. Associated with this, can you tell what types of dry eye? What is the insufficient component associated with, with this dry eye? What is the most effective therapy for this dry eye? The answer is provided by TPOT, tear film oriented diagnosis. In order to discover the specific components responsible for tear film breakup, it is important to have a proper understanding of the dynamic behavior of each tear film layer until complete establishment of the tear film, because all of the specific components are needed for the establishment of the tear film and to achieve tear film stability. And any missing components will affect the tear film dynamics, which is directly reflected in, tear, in the breakup patterns. This slide shows the dynamic behavior of each tear film layer until the establishment of tear film is theoretically. During eye opening, capillary suction pressure from the upper meniscus pulls the acus tears up, resulting in the deposition of acus tears of the cornea. However, insufficient suction to pull the lipid layer up results in the surface pressure gradient on the lipid layer of the tear film immediately after eye opening. This gradient in turn results in the upward move spread of tear film lipid layer, which simultaneously drags access aqueous tears up. However, simultaneously with the aqueous drug, there is an aqueous thinning by the capillary suction effect pressure of the lower tear meniscus. In those movies obtained from the same eye, tear film lipid layer behavior together with the fluorescent stained acus movement can be seen. After the cessation of the upward spread of tear film lipid layer uh, or upward movement of the acus tear film, precolonial tear film is established. Related to this tear film establishment, five different essential tear film breakup pattern can be classified. The first is the area break, when the acus tear volume is extremely diminished. You can see no upward movement of fluorescence after the eye is kept open. And the superficial keratopathy is very severe. You can see that. The second is the spot break, when the wettability of the cornea surface is impaired. 
you can see the spot break immediately after eye opening. But during upward movement of fluorescence, some smaller spot break will disappear. The third is the line break, resulting with, uh, from the simultaneous action as explained. ACAS drug due to the upward spread of tear film lipid layer and suction from the lower tear meniscus, which result in the thinner area at the inferior part of the cornea, leading to the line-like breakup during upward movement of fluorescence. The fourth is the dimple break which is in contrast with the line break. Breakup occurs at the, uh, around the center of the cornea or superior to the cornea, superior part of the cornea surface, which is speculated to be related to the decreased wettability of the cornea surface. Dimple break occurs during the upward movement of fluorescence. It is important point. The fifth is the line random break which is thought to be related to increased evaporation. After the eye is opened, after the stoppage of fluorescence, upward movement of fluorescence, tear film repeat, they have precolonial tear film is completely established. After the eye is open, even after the uh, complete establishment of tear film, we can see the breakup. It, is, it corresponds to the London break which appear after the complete establishment of tear film. So due to the evaporation mechanism. This is a summary of the classification of fluorescent breakup patterns. Fluorescent breakup patterns can be classified into five patterns, which include area, spot, line, dimple, and random breaks. And that these are essential breakup patterns that occur in dry eye based on different mechanisms. In addition, rapid expansion of the break joined in this essential breakup patterns. And here you can see the case of line break with rapid expansion. Sorry. Okay. Uh, line break, rapid expansion, you can see. Line break appears, it expands very rapidly horizontally to uh, horizontal direction. Based on the breakup patterns, we can suggest the insufficient components of the ocular surface for teapot. Area break, line break, uh, insufficient component is acre split. Spot break, dimple break, rapid expansion, insufficient component is max 16. And the random break, lipids, and or Mac 5 ac are deficient. Also, breakup patterns we can, uh, we also we, based on the breakup pattern we can suggest the drier subtype. Area break correspond to severe acus deficient dry eye. Line break correspond to mild to moderate acus deficient dry eye. Random break correspond to increased above evaporation dry eye, spot and dimple break, and the rapid expansion of the breakup thought to be correspond to decreased availability dry eye. Accordingly, we can propose most appropriate topical therapy for as teapot, which is now available in each Asian countries. So for area break, functal plaque and as tear tears are as the basic treatments. The for line break, decohosol, which can enhance the uh, volume, uh, increase the volume of a castilla volume. And for spot break and the dimple break, rapid extra max 16 is necessary and the decohosol can supplement this. For random break, hyaluronic acid, cationone, can, uh, can enhance the treatment for tear film lipid layer. And the therapy from MGD is essential for MGD case. And the decohosol is also useful to uh, suppress the random break. This, uh, sorry, this slide shows the classification of dry eye disease proposed by teapot due to two. Please note that for the classification of dry eye, teapot due to proposed only two dry eye subtypes, including acus deficient and evaporate. 
although there is a mixed type of those. This slide shows a new dry eye disease classification proposed by the Asia Dry Eye Society, in which decreased wet ability dry eye is included as an important and neglectable dry eye subtype. And the corresponding main breakup patterns for each dry eye subtype are in indicated. Here, I would like to introduce a fundamental knowledge about the wettability of the surface. Please have a look at uh, this photo and uh, note the water droplet, droplet on the petals. When the petals are tilted, it is expected that water droplet will easily fall off. So like with petals, Stability of the acus fluid is not only determined by the specific fluid components, but also by the wettability of the surface. It is known that the condition of the contact of acus fluid to the surface is determined by the wettability of the surface, and that when the wettability, in other words, uh, hydrophilicity and the water holding property of the surface is better the acus fluid is more stable. In regard to the water repellency of the surface, this relationship is reversed. On the surface of the cornea, wettability is thought to be maintained by the intactness of Mach 16, the longest of the um, membrane-associated mucins, which is expected uh, expressed at the corneal surface which can be supplemented by Zikohosol eye drops. Please watch this movie. This is an example of decreased wettability dry eye in which you can see a spot break at the upper part of the cornea immediately after eye opening. And the random break with rapid expansion at the lower part of the cornea in which after the tear film is established on the cornea, confirmed by the stoppage of upward movement of fluorescence. Once a random break happens, it expands very rapidly due to the decreased wettability of the cornea surface. Spot break and rapid expansion of the breakup both correspond to the breakup patterns seen in decreased wettability dry eye. We should pay more attention to decreased wettability dry eye, which can be uh, diagnosed through T-pod based on breakup patterns. Here, I'd like to introduce the very important steps of how to effectively perform T-pot via fluorescent breakup patterns. First, in order to increase tear volume, a less invasive way for staining tears is essential. Installation of two eye drops or saline or artificial tear tear followed by vigorous shaking of the stained strip, uh, stained strip and just touching the central top of the strip to the lower lid margin. I showed here three times, but once is enough. Second, after several blinks, the patient is verbally instructed to briskly eye open, opening the eye and keep the eye open for after gently closing the eye three times. Gentle close, rapid eye opening, and which is followed by the by keeping the eye open for three times to confirm the reproducibility of the breakup, to confirm the rapid expansion of the breakup in this case. Please note that a reproducible and breakup pattern must be more related to the pathophysiology. The first case corresponds to spot break, and the second case corresponds to the line break with rapid expansion both corresponding to the decreased wettability dry eye via T-pot. This slide shows the layer by layer point treatment T-pot for dry eye using decohosol sodium hydrops. It involves the combination of the tear film stabilization via the supplementation of acus tears and the mucins with decohosol sodium hydrops and the suppression of resultant inflammation with steroid eye drops. For example, in our dry eye clinic, we use 
Point Wapan said uh, fluoromethalone twice daily initially and at exacerbation. Dicohosol sodium eyedrop successfully treat the vicious cycle via the supplementation of the tear film, uh, stabilization of the tear film through, through the supplementation of acus tears and mucins, which result in decreased epithelial damage, increased wettability, and further stabilization of the tear film. I believe that dicohosol is expected to promote an enhanced expression of Mac 16 that leading to snowball-like improvement of vicious cycle and the further improvement is expected via the continuous use. In general, short BUT dry eye with a spot break cannot be treated sufficiently by the conventional therapies such as frequent use of artificial tears and hyaluronic acid. However, it can be treated by decohosol sodium hydrops via the enhanced expression of MAC-16. Looking at these movies, you can see that spot break implying decreased availability of cornea surface can be treated successfully by decohosol sodium hydrops. This is another example of decreased availability dry eye treated with decohosol eye drops. Before the treatment, the breakup pattern is a random break at the first sight. However, upward movement of fluorescent stained acus layer is attenuated, and the fluorescent breakup appears quickly and expands very rapidly. Thus, abnormality of the lipid layer due to the uh, insufficient elasticity of the tear film lipid layer property, and or, or the max 5 ac and max 60 are uh, speculated. Therefore, decohosol is the first choice for, of t in this case. This case corresponds to the combination of increased evaporation with decreased wettability dryer. At the two months after the treatment, you can see the improvement with only a random break with no expansion of the breakup. This is another example of decreased wettability dry eye treated successfully with decohosol sodium hydrops. Before the treatment, the primary breakup pattern is a spot break. Line break with rapid expansion can also be seen, which all correspond to decreased wettability dry eye. Spot break and line break with rapid expansion suggests insufficient expression of Mac 16. Thus, decohosol is the first choice of T40 in this case. This case corresponds to decreased availability dry eye. At four months after the treatment, you can see the improvement with only random break with no rapid expansion. Recently, I published a book entitled T-Port and T-Port Expert Lecture, Paradigm Shift in the Clinical Practice for Dry Eye. You can enjoy the 25 T-Port and T-Port quizzes on your mobile uh, device. An English version of this book will be delivered by Santen soon. I hope you will be able to master T-Port and T-Port through reading this book. In summary, from the point of tear film oriented diagnosis for dry eye, not only the detection of the spot and or dimple breaks, but <clears throat> also detection of rapid expansion of the dry spot must be essential for properly diagnose of decreased availability, cornea surface and or decreased availability dry eye. MAC-16 have a key role in the maintenance of the coronal surface wettability and the decreased wettability would be treated by decohosol thorium via the increased expression of MAC-16. Therefore, from the point of tear film oriented therapy T-pot for dry eye, decohosol sodium eye drops would become an effective topical therapy for cases with decreased wettability of dry eye. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for that excellent and informative lecture.
I'm personally excited about your book. I think this will absolutely help a lot of us who are trying to learn and understand this new concept. Uh, we have here a few questions um, personally sent by some of the members of our audience. Um, the first question being, I think it's a good uh, way to summarize things. Would it be correct to say that when we see a line break with rapid expansion and a normal tear meniscus, that this is decreased wettability rather than aqueous deficient dry eye? I think it is important. Uh, line break with rapid expansion with normal tear meniscus correspond to the decreased wettability dry eye. Because uh, at the lower part of the cornea, tear film is likely to break up due to the uh, acus drug by the splitting lipid layer and the suction effect and the, from the lower meniscus. But in case with decreased wettability, cornea surface can, uh, uh, acus tears cannot deposit it at the lower part of the cornea effectively in that which result in the easier break, line break. Mm. And the rapid expansion of the breakup implies that the wettability, water holding property of the surface is impaired. So line break with rapid expansion, if the acus tear volume is enough, and normal with normal tear meniscus, which implies that the wettability of cornea surface is impaired, especially at the lower part of the cornea. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Professor. Uh, we have a second question. Uh, our audience is asking, would decreased wettability explain the tear film instability seen in conjunctival calasis? Uh, it is a very good question. Uh, it is known uh, in our department especially. <laughs> uh, when the conjunctival calasis distributes at the inferior part of the cornea, prominent conjunctival calasis occupies the lower tear meniscus. When the eye is opened, uh, spot break is likely to be seen. So uh, conjunctival calasis located at the inferior part of the cornea is associated with uh, spot break. It is sometimes the case, but the explanation for this is very difficult. <laughs> I, I have to show with a scheme or something. So please okay. uh, note that the spot break is likely to be associated with the conjunctival calasis located at the imperial part of the cornea. Thank you very much for that information, Professor. A lot of us have been asking that question actually, and um, it would be nice to have you back again to discuss conjunctival calasis. Uh, we have okay. a third question. Um, yes. Uh, somebody's asking, sometimes we see spot and or dimple break with a line and area break in patients with low tear meniscus and shortened tremor. Is this aqueous deficiency, dry eye, or decreased wettability? Uh, it's a very good question. <laughs> but if we see the SPK at the lower part of the cornea in, with line break, we attribute the cause for the uh, breakup to the decrease to uh, 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 acus tear deficiency. Because in acus tear deficient eye, uh, tear turnover is a lot, uh, delayed, which results in the accumulation is chemical mediators. Okay, inflammation. Uh, uh, acus tear deficient dryer is likely to be associated with the accumulation with, uh, of uh, the chemical mediator uh, more in, in related to inflammation, acus tear deficiency. Now, as a result, uh, accumulated uh, chemical mediator cut the MAC-16 at the proteolytic site of the MAC-16, which result in uh, decreased availability. So, acus tear deficient dry eye is sometimes accompanies the decreased availability dry eye uh, as a result. So we can see line break together with uh, spot break or dimple break together with line break, we encounter uh, in some cases. And for the area break as well, when the eyes are opened, uh, uh, 
amount of tear film, uh, Acas tears on the corner is not so diminished. We can see the spot break uh, with area break. But in, in, in area break, we don't see any uh, dimple break. We mm. call this partial area break. In partial area break, tear film acus layer cannot spread over entire the cornea. We can see the partial uh, spreading of the uh, partial upward movement of fluorescence. In that case, at the leading edge of the fluorescent movement, we can see the dimple break. But it is somehow, uh, somewhat complicated to explain, but you can see, uh, understand in my book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Again, we're very excited about that book. Uh, yeah. We have a fourth question. Uh, do secretagogues like the Poisson stimulate production of surface and circulating mucins equally? Or are certain types of mucins upregulated more than others with this type of treatment? Sorry, uh, please repeat again. Um, somebody is asking if mm. secretagogues like the Quaposol mm, equally mm. stimulate the surface and circulating mucin. Ah, okay. Uh, Dicohosol can enhance the uh, production of MAC5 AC uh, immediately after uh, several minutes. Oh, I'm not sure about the time, uh, but uh, almost immediately after eye drop installation. But for the enhancement of MAC16 expression, I, I think clinically it depends on the cases. I, I don't think equally, I don't think uh, MAC16 is equally, uh, equally uh, expressed in each patient. Some patient is resistant to, uh, some uh, decreased vertebrity dryer is resistant to MAC6 uh, decohosol application. And we still see, uh, see the spot break or dimple break even after the long time treatment. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so MAC 5 ac production is expected in all cases, I think. But for the expression of MAC-16, it may differ uh, between cases, I think. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, for our last question, um, somebody is asking, for how long should you give the Quaposol to expect the results? Uh, we have to continue. <laughs> Uh, how sorry. Long, how, how long? How long should you give? Yes. Uh, when the, uh, for example, when the spot break or dimple break is completely treated by decohosol, it changes to the random break. So we want to stop the decohosol. But when we stop the decohosol, once again, spot and dimple break appears again. Because uh, we don't treat uh, the uh, the mechanism completely, I think. Mm. So we, dry eye continues, but decohosol can uh, supplement uh, the submax 16, which uh, uh, improves the tear film stability, but uh, this condition is only maintained by the decohosol application. So when we stop the decohosol, uh, the background condition appears again. So we have to continue mm. to use Decohosol, I think. So would you say, Professor, that this can be a drug that can be uh, some sort of a maintenance drug for yeah, some yeah. of our patients? Yes, we have to maintain. But uh, we can reduce the installation times, I think. From, From six, six times? To four or something. But to two is too small, I think. OK. Okay, so thank you, Professor Yokoi, for answering our questions. Um, while we're stepping up for the next segment, let's all watch a short clip from today's sponsor, Santen. Okay. Dry eye disease derives from problems with the quantity or quality of the tear film. The healthy tear film is composed of a specific balance of salts, lipids, proteins, and water. Together, these lubricate and protect the eye. Alterations to tear production or composition can reduce the stability and increase the osmolarity of the tear film. 
leaving the eye prone to damage or irritation. When irritation occurs, the ocular tissue recruits T-cells to the area. These secrete cytokines, leading to inflammation and further altering tear production. Over time, this vicious circle of inflammation can lead to corneal damage, which can be assessed using corneal fluorescein staining, or CFS. Chronic conditions such as keratitis and dry eye disease require ongoing treatment. While anti-inflammatory corticosteroids have been used to manage the condition, there are concerns about the safety of long-term use. Topical cyclosporin is a well-tolerated treatment for dry eye disease that reduces inflammation at the ocular surface. However, the hydrophobic structure of cyclosporin makes it difficult to create topical ocular formulations, and the tear film creates a barrier which reduces drug penetration. Pharmacists sometimes prepare compounded solutions of cyclosporin for patients with dry eye disease. However, preparations created in pharmacy may not be standardised, nor are they clinically evaluated for their safety or efficacy. Icurvis is a standardised, licensed formulation of cyclosporin, solubilised in nano droplets composed of oil and positively charged surfactants. Following administration, the positively charged nano droplets in Icurvis are electrostatically attracted to the negatively charged cellular layer of the corneal surface. This attraction allows for optimal spreading and prolonged adhesion of Icurvis on the ocular surface, facilitating maximum delivery into the corneal epithelium and to the T cells beyond. Here, cyclosporin can inhibit IL-2 cytokine production, impeding T cell differentiation and proliferation, and reducing further inflammation. Icurvis delivers cyclosporin to the cornea and is effective at up to 10 times lower concentrations than unlicensed preparations. Research shows that following once daily dosing with Icurvis, the expression of inflammatory markers begins to fall within one month of treatment. As T cells have a lifespan of 100 to 120 days and cyclosporin inhibits new undifferentiated T cells, clinical improvements might take some time to appear. Clinical studies demonstrate that tear osmolarity can return to the normal range within six months and that symptoms can continue to improve over 12 months of treatment. The formulation of Icurvis was developed over 10 years and has undergone full clinical testing. Icurvis is manufactured in a controlled, sterile environment and is provided with consistent labelling and instructions for patients. Its once daily nanodroplet formulation is well tolerated and effective for long term use. Break the vicious circle of inflammation in dry eye disease with a curbis. Before we move on, I'd like to announce that Santan will be giving away breast shields to the first 500 participants with the aim of protecting both our doctors and patients during this pandemic. If you'd like to be one of the recipients, kindly wait for the announcement of the mechanics at the end of the show. So up next, we will be having case presentations from three institutions, the Medical City, Philippine General Hospital, and East Avenue Medical Center. Professor Yokoi will give us insights and comments after each case is presented. Now for our first speaker, she finished her residency in the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute, where she is currently doing her fellowship in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery. Today with us is Dr. Christina Tan to present the first case. Hi, Tina. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Dionko, for the kind introduction. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I am presenting on behalf of the Medical City's Eye and Vision Institute. Next slide, please. My case is LDR, a 72-year-old female housewife with a chief complaint of eye discomfort or foreign body sensation with redness on both eyes. Next slide. For the history of present illness, the patient was previously diagnosed with glaucoma in 2013. She underwent trabeculectomy with bleb revision, both eyes, and has been on chronic and frequent shifting of topical anti-glaucoma medications for the past six years because of the limited financial capabilities. She then developed a mild superficial punctate keratopathy, both eyes, in 2019, 
which we treated by giving sodium hyaluronate or high back eye drops four to six times a day and a lack of eye gel once at bedtime. We also shifted her to a preservative-free IOP lowering medication, which is Travaprost or Travatan Z, once at bedtime. So later on, we noted that the patient's SPKs had progressively worsened. This was mostly due to her non-compliance and frequent shifting of her medications. So the patient progressively worsened um, with her worsening of her eye discomfort and redness. So therefore, she sought consult at our clinic. Next slide, please. So for the ocular history, we have mentioned that the patient was diagnosed with primary angle closure glaucoma for both eyes in 2013, and she underwent a YAG LI in 2013 with a succeeding trabeculectomy with mitomycin C in 2013 and 2014. She also underwent a bleb revision with 5-fluorouracil in 2015 and 2016. So upon gonioscopy after these procedures, it was revealed that she had open angles. But the patient sometimes presented with uncontrolled IOP, ranging from the 20s to 30s millimeters mercury. For the ocular surface disease, the patient had no pre-existing OSD prior to the glaucoma treatment. However, she developed her mild superficial punctate keratopathy with dry eye syndrome for both eyes, which then progressively worsened. She also developed toxic medicamentosa bilaterally, and we noted that during our examinations with her, the T-butt was very low. Next slide, please. The patient is also pseudophagic, both eyes, status post cataract surgery in 2015. Next slide. She is also hypertensive. Next slide. For the patient's glaucoma, we were treating the right eye with brinzolamide and brimonidin, or Simbrinza eye drops, twice a day, and both eyes were being treated with Travacross preservative-free or Travatan Z eye drops once at bedtime. For ocular surface disease, we were treating both eyes with sodium hyaluronate or Hyabac eye drops four to six times a day and a lacrovisc eye gel once at bedtime. She was also being treated with losartan 50 milligrams once daily for her hypertension. Next slide. So the patient has had a poor drug compliance over the years because of her limited finances, and this has led her to frequently shift her medications over the past six years. And so she relies heavily on sample medications that we give her at our clinic. Next slide. The patient lives with her husband, who also has glaucoma, and relies on her children for finances and follow-ups. Her son has also been diagnosed with glaucoma recently. Next slide. So moving on to symptom assessment, the patient has an OSDI score of 40, which indicates a moderate severity of her symptoms. Next slide. On physical examination, the patient's uncorrected visual acuity is 20 over 200 minus 2, with no improvement on pinhole for the right eye. The left eye is 2160 plus 2, which is corrected to 2025 on pinhole. The refraction was unremarkable, and applanation tonometry was soft on both eyes. Spagnoscopy revealed open angles on all quadrants, and a fundoscopy showed a cup disc ratio of 0.9 to 1 with pale nerves on both eyes. Next slide, please. Visual field test was also done, and as you can see here, there is severe glaucomatous damage for both eyes. Next slide. So an examination of the lid margins revealed plug mebomin glands with telangiectasia and lid hyperemia, as you can see in the pictures below. So the mebomin gland grading was A3B3 for both eyes with toothpaste-like secretion and no expression of glands. Next slide. Slit lamp examination for the right eye revealed a hazy cornea with limbal neovascularization, diffuse SPKs with irregular corneal surface, a flat vascularized bleb, iris pigments on the endothelium with iridocorneal touch superitemporally, and IOL was in place. The left eye revealed diffuse SPKs, a cystic bleb, and an IOL in place. Next slide. So here are the dry eye tests, which we did, and these include the following. So the first is the tear meniscus height, which is slightly reduced at 0.17 and 0.16 millimeters. The nick butt is very short at 0 seconds on the right and 2.48 seconds on the left. Schirmer's test was also done, which is slightly reduced at 6 millimeters on the right and 10 millimeters on the left eye. The tear osmolarity test was not done for this patient because of the lack of her funds. Next slide, please. 
So on gross examination, we note that there is moderate redness, which we can see here in the pictures around the limbal and bulbar areas of both eyes. Next slide, please. So this is a video. So on assessment of the lipid layer, as we can see here, so we'll just play the video. So as we can see here, there is so as we can see here, um, there is no um, upward movement of the tear film, and the tear film has a very pale whitish hue for both eyes. So this indicates a significant lip lipid deficit bilaterally. Next slide. So on mybography, it was revealed that more than 67% dropout of glands was seen in both eyes. Next slide. So this is another video. So we'll just play it first. So we'll have the patient blink several times. Okay. So as we can see in the video, there is no upward movement of the tear film, and this indicates the absence of the lipid layer. You can also see areas of diuptake with punctate keratopathy. Also, the T-butt was at zero seconds, and the tear breakup pattern coincides with an area break. Next slide, please. So similar to the right eye, upward movement of fluorescein was also not observed. You can also see punctate keratopathy. The T-butt was at two seconds, and the tear breakup pattern also coincides with an area break. Next slide. So based on our findings, our tear film-oriented diagnosis for this case is a mixed type of dry eye. So we have an aqueous deficiency dry eye combined with an evaporative deficiency with severe mebomian gland dysfunction bilaterally. Next slide. So finally, we move on to the management. Our management for this case is actually twofold. So the first um, part is to treat the glaucoma, and the second would be to treat the patient's dry eye. So in managing the patient's glaucoma, we divided the treatment into medical and surgical categories. So medically, we discontinued the offending toxic agent. In this case, those medications with preservatives that are toxic to the corneal surface were discontinued. We also shifted the patient to a preservative-free anti-glaucoma medication. So as we mentioned earlier, we gave the patient Travatan Z once at bedtime. So surgically, uh, we have two possible alternatives if the pressures are still not controlled medically. So we can opt to do a se selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT. The IOP lowering effect is said to be comparable to that of prostaglandins. And we can also opt to do a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery or MIGS in order to further reduce the pressure, just in case the IOP is not controlled. Uh, next slide. So aside from the glaucoma treatment, we have the second arm. The second arm is to treat the patient's dry eye. So since we have a mixed type of dry eye, we have a twofold approach in our management. So the first is for the aqueous deficiency, and the second is for the mebomian gland dysfunction. So we treated the aqueous deficiency by giving the patient a preservative-free lubricant, which is diquacosol or diquas, six times a day for both eyes. We also applied punctal plugs bilaterally in order to increase tear film volume. However, aside from increasing tear film volume, we also wanted to treat the inflammation as it also played an important role in exacerbating the dry eye in this case. So we gave the patient cyclosporin or icurvis twice a day and a short course of steroids, lotiprednol, four times a day. So the second half is in treatment of the MGD. So for the MGD, we advised the patient to do lid hygiene and warm compress to stimulate expression. And we were also thinking of giving oral omega-3 fatty acids for this patient, but um, maybe not due to um, the patient's limited financial capabilities. So lastly, we applied an intense pulse light or IPL and a low-level light therapy in order to improve the patient's MGD. So that is the end of my case, and thank you for your attention. Uh, next slide. So I would like to ask Professor Yokoi three questions regarding this case. So the first one, uh, in these types of cases, Professor, what is your preferred approach to management? Um, and second, when patients are in prolonged topical anti-glaucoma therapy, what is your threshold for deciding to perform surgical procedures? And lastly, do you observe a specific tear breakup pattern when patients are improving from treatment? 
So thank you, Professor, and thank you, Dr. Thank Day. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, let's now ask Professor Yokoi to give his comments on the presentation. We will begin with the video first, Professor, followed by the di diagnosis and management, and we will end with the discussion point. So, Professor? Okay. Please show us the video repeatedly. This is a light art. In this case, because of severe MGD, there is no repeat layer in the precorneal tear film. Therefore, we can't see any upward movement of fluorescence. Because upward movement of fluorescence corresponds to upward spread of tear film repeat layer. In this meaning, we can diagnose that this is area break. However, it is atypical area break. Because in typical area break, we can see severe punctate, superficial punctate keratopathy distributed widely over the cornea. However, in this case, we can't see well the severe punctate keratopathy. In addition, immediately after eye is opened, acus tears, tears are deposited on the cornea, and even when the eye is kept open, this deposited acus tear film is very stable over time without showing any breakup. So based on the classification of breakup pattern, this is a typical area break from the meaning that tear film lipid layer is absent. However, deposited acus tears are enough to keep acus tear film stable. Please note that we did not include MGD in our breakup pattern classification. And therefore, this is a typical breakup type of breakup pattern, which is not included in our classification. However, if we have uh, fundamental knowledge about the tear film dynamics, we can diagnose uh, the insufficient components of the ocular surface correctly. Okay. The lecture is the same, but uh, BUT is two seconds, so more than this. But I don't think this is the BUT itself. I don't think. Because this uh, deposited acus is very stable over time when the eyes kept open. So I, I think deposited acus is enough to uh, make the tear film on the cornea stable. So this is the area break. Uh, uh, probably, uh, this is the area break in, in the meaning that uh, there is no lipid layer. This is not complete tear film, so this is a this is a uh, area break. I think this is a proper diagnosis, but uh, this classification is not included in my classification. And this is in, in that point, this is atypical. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Professor, would you like to comment on the management? Uh, diagnosis. The diagnosis, yes, Professor. The ah. diagnosis and then the management. Uh, diagnosis, comment on diagnosis. This is a typical area break due to severe lipid deficiency, but the acus tear deficiency is relatively mild because acus tears are deposited and they are stable. So appropriate diagnosis for this case is mild to moderate acus deficiency dry eye combined with increased evaporation dry eye, BRT4. And regarding the comment on the management, I agree with the management proposed by the presenter. In this case, we have to treat MGD and acus tear deficiency. Punctal plugs may not be needed, and PICUAS can make the tear film more stable with the supplementation of acus tears and secretory mucins. In addition, glaucoma eye drops with preservative, especially especially benzalconium chloride and beta blocker with anesthetic action should be avoided. Anti-inflammation treatment is advantageous for not only for dry eye, but also for MGD, I think. Okay. Uh, in the, for the first question, uh, for the di discussion point, 
I adapt a mechanism based treatment to such dry eye cases associated with glaucoma treatment. It is well known that topical anti glaucoma eye drops is likely to make tear film unstable because glaucoma eye drops are likely to contain benzalkonium chloride, which mm. may gi give damage to tear film lipid layer and the coronary epithelium. And the beta blockers having anesthetic effect is known to reduce tear secretion in around 20% in elderly people. So break up, based on breakup pattern, we have to consider which components of tear film and coronary epithelium are insufficient. Then we have to think about the best way to make tear film more stable by considering whether anti-glaucoma eye drop can be replaced with safer ones and or unstable tear film can be treated with dry eye treatment. Okay. My comments for the, the second. for the second uh, questions. Relative indication for surgery is considered depending on the severity of dry eye and depending on the severity of glaucoma. Because eye drops either for dry eye and for glaucoma may interfere with each other. Because frequent use of eye drops for dry eye may affect the adherence of glaucoma eye drops. And the glaucoma eye drops may affect the ocular surface. And therefore, when we cannot treat ocular surface effectively by dry eye treatment, when we cannot treat ocular surface effectively by dry eye treatment, we may have to think about the surgery for glaucoma to reduce the number of glaucoma eye drops with mm. adverse effects on the ocular surface. Okay. Uh, my answer to the third question. Uh, when we see the breakup pattern spot and dimple break, after the successful treatment, we can see the change from those breakup patterns to random break. However, when we see line break, even if it is successfully treated, we still see line break. However, resultant superficial punctate keratopathy becomes less severe. In case with the area break, successful treatment generally results in breakup patterns other than area break. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, professor. Uh, professor, we have an additional question from our audience. Um, okay. One of them is asking, uh, if a patient will require punctal plug, what type of punctal plug would you recommend? Or what is, what is it that you currently use in your practice now? Uh, we usually use uh, eagle plug. Eagle plug, it, it's uh, easy for, for us to insert without migration, any migration for severe ACAS deficient case. But for the uh, short VU type, if the ACAS tears is insufficient, when we insert eagle plus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, epiphora will happen. So in case with uh, uh, sufficient tears, we use the punctal plug F free size. It cannot uh, occlude the punctum uh, completely. So there is less uh, accumulation of tears on, on the ocular surface. So this is safer than other plugs. Professor, the first plug that you mentioned, is that a dissolvable uh, no, 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 no. plug? No, 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 no. We only use uh, silicone plug. Silicone plugs, OK. We don't use this dissolvable plug because it disappears very shortly. Understood, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you, Tina. Thank you, Dr. Dionko. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions. So I guess we'll proceed with our next presenter. Okay. Our okay, next you. presenter completed his residency at East Avenue Medical Center and is currently a cornea and external disease fellow at the Philippine General Hospital, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Let's all welcome Dr. David Tirol. Hi, David. Hi, Keisha. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm David Emil Tirol, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the Dry Eye Clinic of the External 
Disease and Cornea Service from the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in UPPGH, the Centro Ophthalmologico Jose Rizal. Okay, next slide, please. So our case is of a 34-year-old female domestic helper who came for a chief complaint of blurring of vision of both eyes. Next slide. So the patient is a known case of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which started six months prior to consult, when she started feeling symptoms of fever, along with vesicle formation after ingesting ibuprofen while working in Hong Kong. So there, the patient underwent treatment for Stevens-Johnson syndrome under both the internal medicine and ophthalmology service and was discharged improved. However, on the interim, the patient noted progressive blurring of vision associated with photophobia, eye redness, and discharge. So on the next slide. So the patient's medical history. And next slide, please. Next slide. Ocular history were unremarkable aside from Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So moving on. Uh, the patient is currently uh, compliant to medication started back in Hong Kong of prednisone 1%. Uh, one drop four times a day to both eyes and artificial tears, one drop to both eyes every hour, and cyclosporin, one drop to both eyes. Uh, patient is not under any systemic medications. So we move on to the objective evaluation. So uh, pertinent findings for this patient is that the patient's visual acuity is not that good. At 2100, improved to 2070 on both eyes. The dry eye parameters are kind of low, very low on this patient. With no appreciable T-butt readings, uh, we couldn't uh, measure uh, tear meniscus height on this patient. And we could only measure Schirmer's uh, basal secretion on the right eye of 3 millimeters. So next slide, please. So we have uh, gross uh, pictures of both eyes. So we could see here uh, on the right eye and on the left eye, the patient has some uh, corneal opacities along the inferior perilimbal area. Um, apologies for the pictures. Um, we also could see there are some, uh, this patient has already started um, lid margin keratinism and there's no conjunctivalization, however, of the cornea, but there's noted uh, occasional inject, uh, injection on the periphery. So next slide, please. We can also see on uh, cobalt filter with rat, uh, ratten filter, uh, we could see that there's uh, multiple uh, SP keys on both eyes with noted uh, areas of aggregated dye uptake along the inferior, which correlates to the uh, corneal opacity seen in the previous slide. So next slide, please. So we move on to the video of the tear breakup pattern. Okay, so we could play the video. So on op uh, eye opening of the patient, we note that there's no upward movement of fluorescein on this patient. So like, like what Professor Yochayas uh, stated earlier. Uh, so this would imply that the patient has no tear film already in the, uh, on this eye. And also with the presence of SP case, we can see uh, say that this is an area break type of pattern. So we move on to the left eye, please. Okay, so we play the video of the left eye. Here also we see that there's no upward movement of fluorescein and with a uh, very uh, diffuse SP case. Uh, and also there's still the uptake formation on the inferior. So uh, we could say that this also is an area break. So, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so our diagnosis for this patient is dry eye disease secondary to Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And uh, based on our findings on the tear film uh, breakup pattern, so our TFOD for this patient is severe aqueous type, uh, aqueous tear deficiency for both eyes. So our plan for this one, for the rest patient. Next slide, please. So we intend to start the patient on artificial tears, preferably preservative-free drops. Uh, it could be either of uh, hyaluronate uh, acid-based or carbomer, or, uh, whichever is available to the patient. We also start the patient on diquafosol, and we intend to start uh, pontal plugs in this patient. Then since the patient's dry eye is caused by an inflammatory disease, so we continue the patient's cyclosporine. Then since we had some areas of 
epithelial defects. So we intend to start um, bandage contact lens and autologous serum to help uh, in the healing of the cor uh, corneal epithelium. Okay, next slide, please. So our discussion points for this, I'd like to ask Professor Yokoi uh, if, um, if we could apply TFOT to other kinds of dry eye disease, especially those that are secondary to uh, other causes. So uh, could we use this for severe dry, dry eye cases? Can this be uh, used to delineate the endpoints of therapy? And could we also use this as a measure for response to therapy? Then also, like what was shown earlier by Dr. Ratan, uh, is there a spectrum in the severity of the TFOD system? Is there a finding between uh, area break and uh, to uh, spot break? Uh, do we see a typical in, along that spectrum? Thank you. So that would end my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, David. Uh, we will now ask Professor Yokoi to give his comments on the presentation. Professor? Uh, please start from the video. Mm. Uh, please show us the uh, left eye, because the right and the left eye look similar from the point of teapot. Professor, um, would you like to comment on the pattern that is seen yes, on yes, the sir. left eye? Left eye, please. Uh, in this case, the doctor had to use finger to assess the eye opening because of the severe light sensitivity of the patient. However, in this case, finger-assisted technique successfully helped to find that there is no upward movement of fluorescence, which implies that there is no lipid in the precorneal tear film. In this case, we can see that deposited acus is very thin, and the superficial punctate keratopathy is very severe, showing some vortex appearance in both eyes. Therefore, as the presenter pointed out, the proper diagnosis for breakup pattern is typical area break, in which we can confirm the absence of upward movement of fluorescent stained acus tear film. However, please note that there are two reasons when we can't see any upward movement of fluorescent after eye is open. One is severe acus tear deficiency, in which tear film lipid layer cannot spread over the thin acus layer. The other is the case with severe MGD, which was presented in case one, in which even if acus tear volume is enough, upward movement of fluorescence cannot be observed due to the absence of tear film lipid layer. Okay. Everybody can understand this. Yes. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Uh, so I will move, would like to move on to the comments on the diagnosis. I completely agree with the presenter diagnosis of typical area break and severe acus deficiency dry eye in both sides. I'd like to talk, talk about uh, comments, a uh, comment on management. For the treatment of this case, retention of, retention of sufficient acus tears to the ocular surface is essential. And we have to perform punctal occlusion at first, followed by the installation of eye drops. However, please note that ocular surface diseases associated with severe ocular surface inflammation, such as seen in Stevens Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, and GVHD, in addition to severe acus tear deficiency, Severe decreased wet ability is also associated. Therefore, we may better to use decohosol instead of artificial tears in addition to punctal occlusion and anti-inflammatory eye drops. However, in this case, corneal epithelial damage shows vortex pattern or hurricane keratopathy, implying decreased proliferation of basal cells of the corneal epithelium. And therefore, to effectively treat the corneal epithelial damage, we had, to be, had, had better to use bandage contact lens to protect the corneal surface from blink-related friction and to cover the corneal surface with sufficient amount of acus tears. And also, it, bandage contact lens may also improve the vision. However, we should take the best care of corneal infection in that case. Okay. 
And I would like to give a brief answer to the discussion point. Severe ACAS deficiency can be easily diagnosed through T-fold pathway based on breakup patterns. The breakup pattern for severe ACAS deficiency is area break. And the end point of therapy for area break is to obtain improvement in symptoms via the supplementation of sufficient amount of ACAS tears. When area break is changed to the other breakup patterns after the treatment, we can see, we can diagnose further, further another insufficient component based on breakup patterns. For example, after functional occlusion, when the breakup pattern changes from area to dimple, we have to consider the supplementation of max 16 as well. And we can replace artificial tears with decohoso. Okay. Thank you, Professor, Thank for you, answering Professor. Uh, David's discussion point. Um, I think now we'll be moving on to our last presenter. Okay. Uh, our last presenter finished his residency at East Avenue Medical Center, where he served as the chief resident from 2013 to 2014. He obtained his fellowship in cornea and refractive surgery at the National Healthcare Group, I Institute in Singapore. Currently, he is affiliated with several institutions, including the Provision Eye Care Network, and is a teaching consultant at East Avenue Medical Center. Let us all welcome Dr. Matt Geronimo. Hi, everyone. Hello, so, good evening. Um, on behalf of the East Avenue Medical Center, the DOHI Center, I would like to present a relatively more common case compared to the previous two. Um, our case is a EQ, a 61-year-old bank employee who complains of eye pain, especially upon waking. Uh, he has a three-year history of intermittent eye pain with occasional foreign body sensation. No other ocular symptoms were reported. The patient is actually quite healthy. His medical and ocular history is unremarkable. Um, the patient has also been using various types of lubricants as needed as recommended by his coworkers. He reports no intake of any other medications. He works in an air-conditioned environment, <clears throat> roughly about eight hours per day doing computer work. When asked if the breeze was directed towards his first space, um, he informed that um, that was not the case. OSDI questionnaire was also used. He was classified under severe with a score of 36.4. Initial physical exam was quite unremarkable with good corrected near and distance vision. Grade one cataracts were seen incidentally. Uh, Shermer one test was done without anesthetic and with eyes closed. On slit lamp exam, um, next slide please. As you see, the lids are unremarkable, the eye is white and the ocular surface and cornea seems clear. Posterior exam is also unremarkable. We use the oculus keratograph to measure the meniscus height, giving a value of 0.53 in both eyes. Um, Lissamin green staining um, also showed mild areas of uptake on the temporal and nasal aspects of the conjunctiva. And then next slide, please. For the tear breakup pattern, um, for the right eye with this video, uh, upon the upward movement of the eyelid, we can see a line break that rapidly expands. No? Uh, random breaks can, can also be seen later. With the second blink, um, you can also appreciate spot breaks immediately. t was also seen to be approximately two seconds on the first blink. Uh, next slide. The left eye um, shows random breaks occurring at approximately four seconds seen most in the supranasal aspect of the cornea. Right there. Okay. Uh, next slide. So in line with the tear film oriented diagnosis, the right eye probably has a moderate aqueous dry eye as shown by the line break with a rapid expansion. This eye may also have short BUT or decreased wettability dry eye as shown by the spot breaks later in the video. This is more common in computer users in which the BUT is short but the tear production is normal 
and there is minimal uh, or no, no staining seen. The left eye um, may have evaporative dry eye with the observation of random breaks in the clear film examination. So to manage this, uh, we prescribe lubricants for both eyes with the addition of a mucin secretagogue such as uh, the quapasol sodium to the right eye. So as a discussion point, um, there are multiple possible presentations in the peer film exam. And these uh, peculiarities point us to the proper diagnosis and management of our cases. So uh, to Professor Yokoi, how critical is the proper performance of our peer film exam? Thank you, Dr. Hieronimo. Uh, we will now ask Professor Yokoi to give his comments on your presentation. Professor? Uh, let's have a look at the uh, uh, video for light eye for the first. Please repeat the video. Uh, please move the video. Can you show us a video? Oh, okay. In the light eye of this case, in the first blink, line break with rapid expansion is prominent. And the dimple break can be seen at the center of the cornea. And in the second blink, spot break can be seen. At the center of the cornea, it, it is dimple break. Those break up patterns, uh, suggests that the decreased vulnerability of dry eye must be the appropriate diagnosis. But the important point is to confirm the repeatability of the breakup for three times. Therefore, as a proper way of verbal instruction to the subject, central close followed by rapid eye opening for three times is essential. Random break uh, for the light left eye, please move on to the left eye. Uh, random break is correct. However, too long opening the eye is likely to result in reflect tearing. Therefore, the next blink is instructed immediately after the confirmation of the expansion of the breakup. In this case, just a simple random break, so we can't see any rapid expansion. So after mm -hmm. keeping the eye to confirm the exact diagnosis, uh, we instruct the patient to blink in, in, in as a second blink. So third, three times blinking is necessary to confirm the repeatability of the breakup. Okay. And uh, I would like to move on to the comments on the diagnosis. The diagnosis for the light eye is a uh, decreased vulnerability dry eye, uh, which is uh, diagnosed by the line break with rapid expansion. If there is no SPK in the line break region, we do not uh, diagnose this as a acastia deficiency. We properly diagnose this uh, decreased vulnerability dry eye, which is uh, explained in the last presentation. And uh, short BUT type dry eye is a proper diagnosis as well. And uh, in the light eye, I, I agree with the presenter diagnosis. This is a typical random break, so evaporative. Increased evaporation dry eye is a proper diagnosis. I would like to comment on the management. For the light eye, liquid sodium eye drops are the first choice because this is a decreased vulnerability dry eye, so we have to enhance the expression of Mark 16. And to the light, left eye, artificial tears are okay. However, in this case, decahosol sodium eye drops must be better to obtain better complaints. Okay. So I would like to uh, give a brief answer to the question point, discussion point. In dry eye in general, the proper performance of t is critical to find insufficient components of ocular surface and to determine the best therapy based on t -fold. Especially, especially, please keep the appropriate way in mind of staining tears with seeking vigorously the fluorescent strips to do not increase, not to increase the tear volume, and of verbal instruction, gentle close, rapid eye opening, 
and keep the eye open to confirm the expansion of the breakout. They are very important steps. Okay. Thank That's you, all. Professor Thank Yokoi. You. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hieronimo. Uh, we Thank have you, one question from our audience. Uh, Professor, uh, one participant is asking, is short BUT type of dry eye common among computer users? Yes, yes. It's very common in computer use. On computer user, is, uh, age is relatively uh, young. So the tear volume is enough, but uh, in case with de decreased vulnerability, uh, spot or dimple break is very common to be find, found. And so we uh, attribute its cause for the breakup to the decreased vulnerability. And they short BUT, it is categorized as a short BUT dry eye, and it's very common in office workers. There's, thank you, Professor. There's a follow-up question. Uh, what is the reason behind short BUT being common among computer users? Uh, it's a very good uh, question, but uh, difficult to answer. But uh, in my opinion, uh, when we intense, uh, uh, intensely looking at the computer, once breakup happens, we have to look at the computer without any blink. At this, as a result, the corneal surface is exposed to air, it results in the decreased vulnerability. So when we have a next blink, ACAS cannot uh, protect the decreased vulnerability surface sufficiently. So in that case, repeated uh, breakup at the decreased vulnerability region result in showing short BUT type dry eye, I think. Thank so, you, Professor. So uh, opening the eye is more than the breakup time. It results in the decrease of vulnerability, I think. Thank you, Professor. That's actually very relevant to us right now because a lot of us are using our computers all the time. And I guess um, given this new knowledge, we have something that we can advise our patients with. Okay. Okay, so I think there are no more questions from our audience. So I'd like to remind everyone uh, to fill out the attendance and evaluation form by clicking the link in the comments section below. And now uh, for next episode of TMCI TV, we have partnered with Alcon to give you an online instructional course on pars plana and tear vitrectomy. This will be another interesting session and we do hope that all of you can join us again on June 18, Thursday at five o'clock in the afternoon, Philippine Standard Time. And to end this first episode, we have the president of San Pen Philippines, Mr. Manuel Manyalak, for some remarks. Good evening, I am Manny Manyalak, president for San Pen Philippines. It is a great honor for San Pen in supporting the very first episode of the TMC ITV entitled Updates on the Asia Dry Eye Society's Guideline on Pivot Concept. Congratulations to the organizer of the webinar, headed by the Director for the Medical City, Eye and Vision Institute, Dr. Victor Caparas, to the host, Dr. Keisha Deonco, and the equally interesting case presentation from the Medical City, Philippine General Hospital, and East Avenue Medical Center. Thank you for generously sharing okay. your time and actual clinical experience in the practice of the TIFOT concept. To the speaker, Professor Yokoi, thank you very much your lecture has always brought new insights from your current research and updates on the TIFOT concept. To all the ophthalmologists who have watched this webinar, rest assured that Santin will continue to support and adapt to this new normal with more webinars to support your continuing medical development. Again, thank you for having us for the first episode of the TMC ITV. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Mr. Maniala. As I have mentioned earlier, Santan will be giving away free breath shields for those who have tuned in to today's episode. To avail of this, all of you, all you have to do is to visit their page, click like, share, and visit the link on the TMC ITV post. 
you will then be redirected to an online registry to avail of a free breast shield from Santen. Uh, Professor Yokoi, uh, there's an additional question from our audience, and I think we still have enough time to answer. Uh, is it okay, Professor, if I ask you one more question? Yes. Uh, the last question is, would, should we treat anti-inflammatory agents first? Should we treat patients with anti-inflammatory agents first before placing punctal plugs? And how long before? Uh, sorry, together with punctal plug, you are talking about anti-inflammatory inflammation therapy? Yes, Professor. He uh, is asking if, yes, we should treat, how long should we treat with anti-inflammatory agents first before placing punctal plugs? Uh, in general, we treat dry eye using uh, tears, uh, for example, it equals with uh, anti-inflammatory treatment, eye drops uh, such as fluorometron. At one month, one month after the beginning of the treatment, and uh, after one month, we treat, uh, we use anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, we use steroids uh, when at exacerbation only. So we start from using both together, but after the uh, uh, tear film stability is improved, it is not necessary to continue to use uh, anti-inflammatory eye drops because breakup, uh, inflammation is a result of the breakup. So we can, when we can treat uh, break up sufficient, uh, uh, effectively. In that case, we, it is not necessary to continue to use uh, steroids or something. So would you say, Professor, that uh, it is only after you use the anti-inflammatory agent that you apply the punctal plug? Or uh, when, we, okay? when we apply the punctal plug, it is the case with the severe ecosteria deficiency. So it, when, uh, we use uh, steroids together with a punctal plug oh, sometimes, but uh, when the tear film stability is improved after the punctal plug uh, with sufficient acus tear volume, uh, in that case, uh, steroid is not necessary. But in, uh, as I talked before, in that uh, in especially the severe acus deficient dry eye related to GVHD, OC3, Stevens Johnson syndrome, continuous use of anti-inflammatory drug is necessary to improve the tear film and the wettability of the cornea surface. So inflammation is stays there uh, continuously, we, so we have to treat the background inflammation. Thank you, Professor Yokoi. Uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in to our first episode co-sponsored with Santen. Professor Yokoi, thank you for spending you. this time with us and for sharing your knowledge. It's always a pleasure to listen to your lecture and we hope to apply this new concept in our clinic. And to our speakers, Dr. Tan, Dr. Tirol, and Dr. Hieronimo, it was a great pleasure to have you. Thank you also, Dr. Dionko. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dionko. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Really hope to see you all again. We hope to see you all again in the next episode of CMC ITV. The IC instruction perceives, borders. Good looks, evening, everyone. understands. Yeah. But the eye also knows how to smile, laugh, cry. It's by studying the eye, its richness and complexities, that Santen has continued to develop and sell for the past 120 years innovative treatments to preserve this precious organ. In today's world dominated by technology, the eye has never been so essential. At Santen, we are committed every day to improving the quality of a patient's sight thus improving their quality of life. Thanks to ever more effective solutions for treating ophthalmic conditions, 
we ensure a brighter future in ophthalmology. Born in Japan, we develop our expertise for the benefit of patients and physicians around the world. Our philosophy, our clear vision, exploring the secrets and mechanisms of nature in order to contribute to people's health. Santen, a clear vision for life.